Let's ask for God's help as we consider his word together. Our God in heaven, I pray that you would use your word to help us to see Jesus. And as we see him, by your mercy, would you help us to trust him more? Please help us now. Help us to listen well. For Christ's sake. Amen. Uh, let's start with two Johnsons, shall we? Um, Samuel Johnson, uh, apparently, I think it's apocryphal, but apparently Samuel Johnson said, Depend upon it, sir, when a man knows he is to be hanged in a fortnight, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. We are in a fix, aren't we? Now, there's no doubt about it, really. Uh, our, our foundations, our comforts have been shattered. I don't think any of us expected to experience this. I don't think any of us expected it, but I do wonder why we didn't expect it. The message from the government this week. Another Johnson, Boris Johnson. There are three things the government is trying to do, or three bits of advice, three things they're working on. Stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Good stuff really isn't it helpful stuff at this time and yet the brutal reality is that the aim to save lives really it really means delaying death doesn't it now I, I think it's quite a shocking way of putting it I, I think quite shocking given what situation we're in. I think it is becoming a bit more personal. Um, I think those who are dying are no longer statistics but they're including people who we know. It's hard. Uh, and I don't know that our society is very well equipped to deal with it. Now, we, we like to push away the thought of death, we like to distract ourselves from thinking about death or we like to make a joke of it. But I don't think we would want to replace the government's aim of saving lives and say, no, what we're really doing is we're just pushing death back. That's all we're trying to do. Delay death. And, and what about us? What about the church? Uh, a guy called Carl Truman, he wrote this week, um, he wrote, In this situation, the task of the church is to mug people with reality before reality itself comes calling. And yet before we can mug people with this reality, uh, we need to look at ourselves. We need to ask how much have we been seduced? Uh, how much have we as Christians forgotten that we are born to die? And as Johnson said, Samuel Johnson, not Boris Johnson, it concentrates the mind. And maybe that sounds like a bit of a bit of a miserable start to things today. And maybe you're wondering where it's going. Maybe you're wondering whether it's worth sticking with it. Uh, I was listening to this isn't necessarily going to help. Um, I was listening to Radio Four this week, and it was talking about um, the drinking of gin in the 16th and 17th century. Uh, and it was it was they were talking about it. They were discussing how miserable life was a few hundred years ago in our country, and how working women would start the day with gin just to get through the misery of it. And, and having heard that on the radio, I also read this week how someone commented that in the past, people didn't go to church to make them happy. People went to church to have their misery explained to them. I find that quite striking given the times that we're in. Struggling, suffering, sickness, the inevitability of death. It's the world that we live in. Uh, and perhaps we are just awakened a little bit to these things in our times. And that might just be the reality that we, the reality that we need to be mugged by. Uh, the reality that needs to be reshaping how we live and how we relate to other people. And let's move to the Bible. Um, it's the beginning of Easter week, it's Palm Sunday, um, and we're looking at Matthew's account of that first Palm Sunday in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 17. 
Ever since Jesus' public ministry began, opposition has been brewing. Uh, Jesus has been in no doubt about the outcome of this. If you just glance over to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 18, we see that for the third time Jesus is saying to his disciples, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day he will be raised to life. So when our passage begins, if you look at verse 1, when our passage begins, as they approach Jerusalem, there is a sense of rising tension. And that doesn't disappoint. Every year the nation would gather to Jerusalem for the Passover festival and, and Jesus is journeying for that festival with a crowd from Galilee, from his, his hometown um, up in the north. And, and this is the crowd who begin to celebrate as they approach Jerusalem. And, and when this crowd reach the city, they are met with another crowd. They're met with the residents of Jerusalem. Now, northerners were treated with suspicion. And you get this rabble kind of invading with a celebration. And verse 10 says this caused the whole city to be stirred. And that's not stirred in a good way. They were unsettled. The, the trouble was brewing. Uh, and Jesus continued his journey into the city and into the temple where he began to throw things around. And he drew the attention. He drew the indignation of the religious leaders. A week after this, it would be those leaders and this crowd who would be baying for his blood. And they weren't disappointed. Tension is mounting. Um, but as this tension mounts, would you, would you just come with me into this passage and let's watch what Jesus does. Now, the first thing I want us to see is, is in verses 1 to 11, how there is a very deliberate disclosure. Uh, I wonder how much thought you give to your profile picture. Now, any kind of online account we have, whether it's our email or social media or whatever it is, that there's an opportunity to take a picture of yourself, to make a statement about yourself. And you can choose what people see and what people don't see. When Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, he is very deliberate about the impression that he wants to make. Now, there's nothing accidental, he knows what he's doing. Now, as they get close to the city, they are on the Mount of Olives. That's already significant, right from the start. Now, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, who we'll come to again in a moment, he foretold how the Lord would come and would stand on the Mount of Olives. And in the times of Jesus, this was understood to mean that the Messiah would approach Jerusalem from that direction. Jesus then sends these two disciples to get a donkey and it seems very much that this has been pre-planned. The donkey and its colt, they're tied up, they're ready for collection because this is how Jesus wants to enter the city. He wants to enter the city riding on a donkey. Now Jesus has just walked a hundred or so miles and he wants to do the last mile on a donkey. What's he up to? Well, we don't need to wander for long because Matthew tells us in verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now the first part of this alludes to Isaiah chapter 62 verse 11. It's a message in Isaiah to a beleaguered and a worn out people, a message of comfort that says your saviour is coming. Isaiah says, say to daughter Zion, see, your saviour comes. And that then morphs in with a message from Zechariah. See, your king comes. And we're to join these together and see that this coming saviour is the king. And the message of Zechariah is that this is a reason to celebrate the Lord is coming to rescue. Your king is coming to bring peace to the world. And how will the coming of this king be recognised? Well, he's going to come riding on a donkey. So the disciples, they do what they're told. They get the donkey, they get its foal, they put down their coats and the crowd, it clicks for them. They, they join the dots, they, they catch on, cloaks get thrown on the road, branches are cut and thrown down. And Jesus is 
showing them that he is the king mentioned in Zechariah and it all just starts to come together. The Old Testament is rammed full of passages which describe the coming of this king and it's like the crowd's memories are just firing off. They latch onto Psalm 118. The Psalm 118 tells of an approach to Jerusalem, into the city and onto the temple. It's a psalm that celebrates that the Lord is my salvation. The Lord has saved me from great troubles. And so as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, the crowds take the words of Psalm 118. Hosanna, they cry, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Hosanna means save us. The crowd add to the psalm. Hosanna, that's from the psalm, save us. By the son of David, add the crowd. The son of David, King David, who lived a thousand years before the birth of Christ. The David who was promised that among his descendants would come a ruler who would reign forever. And then 700 years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Isaiah picked up on it with the passage we hear here at Christmas. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And then Matthew begins his account of the life of Jesus by tracing the ancestry of Jesus back to David. Jesus was born son of David and Jesus was given the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And now in Matthew 21, it just all comes together. The crowds cry to the son of David, save us, Hosanna. And the Old Testament is loaded with these promises of salvation. And in Matthew 21, Jesus takes the full weight of expectation onto his own shoulders. He's proclaiming loud and clear. He's saying that salvation that you have been waiting for. That son of David, that forever king, that Messiah, it's me, says Jesus. And as we consider this passage this morning, we see Jesus deliberately showing us who he is. Life has shifted pace, hasn't it? Now, I imagine we all are feeling this. Now, for some, maybe it's slowed. For some, maybe it's more busy. Uh, but I reckon lots of us are distracted. I, I'm certainly finding that. I, I'm finding it's harder to concentrate. There's just much more buzzing around my mind. There's less rhythm to life. And, and this morning we have this passage, this bit of the Bible where Jesus is deliberately showing us who he is. Jesus is saying, look at me. Look at me. Give me your attention. Watch what I'm doing. Make all of those links. Join all of the dots. Watch me. He's telling us he is the saviour. He is the king who will reign forever. And he's come. And don't we find our minds slip as we try to latch onto this. And we struggle. Something else just jumps to the front of our minds. Or will we let this light pierce our dark? Jesus deliberately makes himself known and as he does we are drawn in, drawn to watch more. The next few things happen quite quickly. They're told to us quite quickly so we can link them together because we've been given an explanation of his saving mission. The second thing for us today is an enacted explanation in verses 12 to 17. Now just, just look at how quickly Matthew moves us through events here. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, the crowds go wild, other crowds are disturbed. And then before we can stop for breath, we are in the temple. See verse 12, Jesus entered the temple courts. Now Psalm 118 is right in the background here. Jesus is he's acting out the movement of the psalm. The coming saviour comes to the city and he comes to the temple. And the crowd are seeing all this. That's why they cut the branches off the trees. That's what Psalm 118 says. And, and the significance, the significance is that when the crowds cry Hosanna, 
But when the crowds cry, save us, we're now going to see Jesus act out an explanation of what that saving means. Because what does it mean to be saved? Now my children like to talk about saving the best till last at mealtimes. Uh, what, what they mean is that the best bit of food on their plate, the bit they like best, they hold back so they can consume it at the end. Uh, for, for that, in that way, to be saved means to be consumed last. When Boris Johnson talks about saving lives, what kind of saving is it? Delaying death. To be consumed last. Is that it? And when we ask God to save us, what do we mean? From coronavirus? From the worries and the struggles and upsets of the day? What is it that we're asking for? Jesus acts out an explanation of his saving mission. He enters into the temple courts. Now, the, the temple was a place of connection. Now, long, long before this, when God brought his people, rescued them out of slavery in Egypt, he promised himself to them. Oh, it's so astounding that this happened. Uh, the God of the universe, the God who is so far beyond our understanding, God who is supreme and perfect in every sense, uh, the only true God broke into history and he declared his intention to put his love on a very, very ordinary group of people. He entered into a covenant with them. He made himself their God. Called them his people. He, he said he wanted to live in a special way with them. So he told them to make a place of connection. And that place eventually became the temple that was built by King Solomon. And after Solomon built his temple, he prayed to God. And, and he said to God, he said, I know it's just a building. And I, and I know you're God and I know that you don't live in buildings that are made by people. And I, I know you can't be locked in. I know you can't be contained into one place. But God has said he would put his name in that place. So that when they prayed toward it, in whatever mess they found themselves in, when they prayed toward that place, God would be ready and willing to forgive all their sins and keep up his promise of love. The temple was a place of connection. Connection between an ordinary and wayward people and the living and most holy God. And so Jesus entered the temple courts. And he found that it was a marketplace. There were buyers, there were sellers, and Jesus, he drives out the merchants. It's another allusion to Zechariah. The last verse of Zechariah says, On that day there will no longer be a merchant in the house of the Lord Almighty. Jesus throws over the tables of the money changers. And, and you can't miss the point here. Jesus does not approve. Like what was happening in the temple, what the temple was being used for, has gone badly wrong. And Jesus gives explanation again with reference to the Old Testament. The temple ought to be a house of prayer. Because that was what it was. It was a place of connection, a, a place for people to meet with and to connect with God. But Jesus says, you've made it into a den of robbers. And the reference is to Jeremiah chapter 7. You see, back in Jeremiah's time, the people thought that just because they had the temple, they were okay with God. Then they thought, just because they have the temple, it doesn't matter about their sin. Just because they have the temple, it doesn't matter about their worship of other gods. As long as they have the temple, they are untouchable. That's what they thought. Very, very religious and very, very empty. And in Jeremiah, just a few verses after, the Lord goes on to say, I will thrust you from my presence. And here is now the pressing need for salvation. If people continue to sin, if people domesticate God, if people ignore God and, and disregard him, if people indulge in empty religion, the end will be 
to be thrust away from the presence of the living God. The inevitability of death. Isaiah wrote of death as a sheet that covers, that envelops all people. We're all there in the same boat. The reality of death, the prospect of our own deaths, confirms to us two things from the Bible. The reality of our own deaths confirms, first of all, that we have all sinned. It's the absoluteness of death that confirms when the Bible says the wages of sin is death. There's no escape from death which proves there's no one who does not sin. And then secondly... Death forewarns of something much worse. And to be thrust away from the presence of the living God is not to go to nothingness. Now God's holiness demands much, much more. And the Bible speaks about a second death. And speaks about a judgment. And it speaks about a punishment beyond death in unspeakable heart. When people prayed toward the temple, God had promised forgiveness of sin. That the temple was a place of sacrifice. The, the temple was, was the place where God had provided a way for punishment to be transferred from a sinner to a substitute. And it satisfied God's justice and it rescued, it saved the sinner. And in our passage, Jesus walks into the temple, but it is a dysfunctional temple. Now that place of connection, that connection had been cut. The place was abused. So Jesus, he, he kicked out the traders, he threw over the tables and he was showing that the days of this temple are over. Now that temple had served its purpose. It is no longer needed. You see, Jesus was called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. And Jesus was in Jerusalem because he would be delivered over to the religious leaders who would hand him over to the Romans and they would crucify him. And Jesus would share that special meal with his disciples where he would point to the wine that they were drinking. And he would say, my blood is like this wine. It will be poured out and it will be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And those sacrifices in the temple were just little pictures. Little pictures of the only sacrifice sufficient to win lasting forgiveness. And so now the temple was no longer needed. And those sacrifices, those pictures were no longer needed because Jesus was here. Because Jesus, the true sacrifice, had come. Now the building as a place of connection was no longer needed. Because Jesus was the true and lasting place of connection, bringing together God and man by the merit of his own blood. Jesus is enacting out an explanation of the salvation that he brings. But what happens next? When you look at verse 14. The blind and lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Now, this is a, a keyhole for us to peek through. Now, you imagine kind of stooping down and, and peeking through a keyhole into a world of wonder beyond wonder. Now, back in Matthew 11, John the Baptist is in prison and, and he sends this message to Jesus from prison. His message is, are you the one who is to come? It's a message from prison. There's John, he's trapped, he's... He's locked in. His future is not good. He will be beheaded soon. And there there's time for him to think. Is Jesus really the one? There's a hopelessness maybe beginning to gnaw at his mind. So he sends a message. Jesus, are you the one? And, and Jesus says to the messenger, he says, he says, tell John what you see. Tell John this. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. Jesus is saying those miracles, they will assure John, I am very much the one. The background is Isaiah chapter 35. Uh, listen to what Isaiah 35 says. Be strong 
Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened. Then will the lame leap like a deer. Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I look through the keyhole. The blind and the lame, they come and they are healed. And the message is, your God has come. And he's come to save. And his salvation is a renewal of the whole of creation. His salvation is a rebuilding of relationship with the living God. It's an end to sorrow and to sighing and to sickness and even to death. And it's always and forever joy. Joy and gladness like you have never known. You've never been able to know because everything in this world is fading. Every joy in this world that we've ever tasted is tainted. But in the world to come, the saving mission of Jesus is not just a rescue from judgment. It's a rescue into imperishable bliss. That's what we see when we peek through the keyhole. But you know, the religious leaders see the wonders, and yet something in them is hardened. And when they hear the children singing, Hosanna to the Son of David, they are indignant. And the, the religious leaders demand of Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Jesus says, yep, yeah, I can hear. And then he says to the Bible experts of the day, haven't you read your Bibles? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth praise. Now, as we consider this passage this morning, now here we see Jesus deliberately showing who he is and Jesus acting out an explanation of his saving mission. What's the response of your heart? Now, people can see wonderful miracles done right before their eyes and still harden their hearts to Jesus. Now we are under this time of social distancing. It's necessary, but it's not easy. Uh, I read a blog this week that said, humans were made for physical presence. So it's natural to feel disordered when this presence is taken from us. Every sense of loss that we feel, every sense of things being disordered, every sense of being destabilised, the grief that we are experiencing. We feel all of this because we were made for connection. And even the best of our human connections are just a shadow of the design of our souls to be connected to the living God. And so maybe we can use our struggles to invest our longing in this promise of salvation that is acted out by Jesus. Jesus comes to restore the deepest connection. He comes to bring his people back to God. Now that's why the the keyhole points us to a place where joy and gladness take over. Because that's what we were made for. And that's what Jesus comes to save us for. There's an acting out of the explanation of Jesus' saving mission. But what use is all of this? What use is it for us? Now on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus puts up this huge signpost. He's deliberately declaring he is the Messiah, that he's come, that he's come to save. And what will we do? Or what will you do as you consider Jesus right now? 
Well, I, I think we're helped as we watch the crowd. In verse 9, the crowds ahead and behind, they shout, Hosanna! That's a great cry. Isn't it right that we take that cry of Hosanna and we make it the anthem of our lives? Hosanna, it means save us. It means save us, but it was used as a shout of praise. And isn't that just right? Now, when we cry to Christ to save us, it's a shout of praise because saving is what he does. That's why he's in Jerusalem. It's why he goes on from our passage to give himself to the cruelty of the cross. It's why he was raised from the dead. It's why right now at the right hand of the Father, he is praying for you. Jesus Christ is saviour. So when we cry to him to save, we're not crying in desperation or despair. We cry with a confidence built on his complete sufficiency. Hosanna, save us. But just in the, the last few moments, let me just press that. I wanted to get our faces into it a bit more to draw out those praises. At the end of the passage, Jesus quotes Psalm 8. He quotes it to the religious leaders. The children are shouting Hosanna and Jesus says, that's right that they do this because from the lips of children and infants, you Lord have called forth your praise. Now, Psalm 8 is a, a, a psalm about the complete majesty of God and the smallness of people. And, and Psalm 8 is about how all praise must be directed to God. All the praise must go to God and God alone. And Jesus says to the religious leaders, all the praise should go to God. And it's right, that's why it's right that these children are praising me. You know, we can't see beyond the end of our noses, can we? When we cry to Christ to save us, we are calling on the one through whom all things were made. We're calling on the one who is before all things and is above all things. We're calling on the one who is strong without limit. And we don't know how he will remake the world. We don't know how he will raise us from our graves to meet him when he returns. We don't know how all our sorrows will flee away. We don't know how he will banish death and sadness. And we don't need to know how he will do any of those things. Because when we cry to him to save, we cry to the one who knows. And the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth given to him. And the one before whom every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ is up to the job of saving us. So let's cry with confidence, Hosanna, save us. But then just, just see the contrast between the end and the beginning of our passage. You see, at the, at the end we see Christ is mighty. At the beginning we're reminded that he is also meek. Now look at verse 5. It just is a wonderful intimacy to verse 5. Do you see that? See, your king comes to you. This intimate, isn't it? It's personal. And you see this. Your king. Christ has bounded himself to you in covenant love. Sealed himself to you in his own blood. He's bound up your life with him your king comes to you and and he is gentle he's meek he's humble he's lowly and though he was rich in heavenly glory he became poor he entered into our mess and our struggle he experienced our life from the inside he even plunged himself into the poverty of death all for you He's gentle and he comes to you. Even now by his spirit, he comes to you. He knows your weakness. He knows your temptations. He knows your fears. Now, the other time in Matthew's account when Jesus is called gentle is in Matthew chapter 11. When Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Christ has come to you, and he is gentle, and he calls us to come to him because he is gentle. So will you cry, Hosanna? And maybe we will cry through gritted teeth. Maybe we will cry with tears. Maybe we will do it in whispers. Or, or maybe we will do it with loud shouts and laughter. But we can call in every season of life and every emotion of the soul. Our Saviour is with us to save. Hosanna! His arm is not too short. His love will not run out. His grace cannot be emptied. His power will keep us right to the end. Through all of the ups and the downs of life, even through the final last enemy of death. And into life beyond, with him forever. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, I pray that in your mercy that the cry of Hosanna to the Son of David, to the Lord Jesus Christ, our mighty and meek Saviour, the cry of Hosanna, may that be the anthem of our lives today and for all our days. Amen.